Welcome to HDB Agronomy Week 2020. The live stream session will start shortly. Before we begin, we wanted to remind you of a few points of housekeeping. You're all on mute, so don't worry, we can't hear you. The session is scheduled to last between one and one and a half hours, including questions. We want this session to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions throughout the session using the live Q&A function in the Agronomy Week platform below. We're recording this session, so if you miss anything or would like to watch it again, it will be available on the HDB YouTube channel and HDB website. You can also come back and watch the recordings on the Agronomy Week platform for three months. At the end of the session, we'll provide you with unique basis and Neuroso codes. Don't forget to complete the basis and Neuroso forms using the relevant tabs on the platform. You have two weeks after the live session to register for your points. Join in the conversation online. Follow AHDB underscore cereals and AHDB underscore potatoes on Twitter and use the hashtag Agronomy Week. If you have any issues with the conference platform, there are digital event FAQs in the menu on the left hand side. You can use the help tab to contact the team if you experience any technical problems during the week. We hope that you enjoy Agronomy Week 2020. Thanks for joining us. Your session will now start. Good evening and welcome to the final session of today. My name is Amber Barton and I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager for the East Midlands region. If you've missed any of the sessions from the week so far, they're all available on demand. A big welcome to our speaker for this session, Dr. Mark Stallam. Uh, Mark has now set up his own consultancy company, but is going to be speaking on behalf of NIAB Cuff uh, today, presenting the desiccation work um, AHDB have commissioned. This desiccation work has been going on across the Spot Farm Network throughout the summer. Uh, Mark is going to speak for around half an hour, um, and then we'll move on to the questions afterwards. I know this is an important topic, um, and so I wanted to just quickly flag the two previous webinars that we've done in August and September. Uh, these are available on the HDB YouTube channel, so have a look at those if Mark doesn't manage to satiate your appetite for desiccation information today. Um, there'll be a, a couple of polls throughout the session, and these can also be found uh, beneath the live feed. You'll be prompted to complete these at the relevant time. Um, anyway, enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Mark now and we can learn all about desiccation. Thank you, Amber. Um, if we could have the first slide, please. Right, so basically I'm going to summarize in this talk the 2019 and 2020 desiccation trials that we did on behalf of AHDB. And right at the beginning um, in May 2019, we wanted to basically find the best alternatives to diquat for desiccation of potato home, focusing on crops that were difficult to kill. So maybe indeterminate crops growing for a long time, maybe with high nitrogen levels and seed crops, which are taken down early. In 2020, um, the list of treatments basically involved two levels of nitrogen to look at whether managing nitrogen could effectively improve the efficacy of the desiccants that we currently got. So in 2019, we had DICOR as one of the controls. In 2020, we were looking at a range of different things. Next slide, please. So the first poll we've got here is basically in relation to that nitrogen, have you used or tried different amounts of N, particularly reducing N to a desiccation. Now, you're going to get roughly a minute to answer this, and I'm going to go on to the next slide and basically talk the background while you make a decision. So next slide, please. So you can see here the four sites that we had, and, and all my collaborators were listed at the beginning and will uh, be uh, listed at the end. So you can see the Spot Scotland Farm, the Spot North Farm, the so-called Spot West um, site that was managed by Cirque Harper Adams, and then disappearing off the map, the Spot East site. So regional variation, a range of varieties, three ware crops, one seed crop. And you can see there the three levels, um, uh, sorry, the two levels of nitrogen that we tried, basically 15% rounded to the nearest kilo. You can see typically for the ware crops, maybe 25, 30 kilos, and for the seed crop, 
um, just over 10 kilos difference. So did it have any difference? Well, follow the results. So next slide, please. So this should show that people did, in majority, actually change their rate of nitrogen. And I did ask basically for reduced N rather than increased N. So we've got the direction right. OK, great. OK, next slide, please. So very simply, um, a list of fewer treatments than in 2019. And what you can see basically is that we have three treatments, basically the control where nothing was done. The sort of more modern chemistry, even though it's quite old, the spotlight goes eye PPO combination. Um, and then the um, treatment at the bottom, which is the more novel one, um, even though it's quite old, the Soltex treatment. Each of those three treatments has a normal standard RB209 recommended rate for the season length, the variety and the soil type, and then a 15% reduction on each of those sites. And those three treatments have a nested factorial design that we can analyze statistically and make a more powerful decision on whether nitrogen is having an effect over a re greater range of treatments. Then we have the other two standalone treatments, the flail and the final san or the uh, pelagonic acid there. What you can see here is basically the different timings. So T1 was the first initial date of application. And then we have these A's and B's that go through. But basically the T2 was applied seven days after uh, the T1 application. And that is indicated in the middle of the table where you see those five Gozai treatments. The T2A was literally following standard practice, I'm not going to say best practice, of allowing three days between a flail going through the crop and then being sprayed with gozai to target the stems and get some of those leaves away. So hence there's the staggered flail treatments, which are, are the A suffixes, so T2A, T3A, um, which are actually only now three days apart in terms of application from the T0, and then they follow up weekly intervals. So you can see the treatments there, and they will appear in the treatment tables that we go through in terms of results. Right at the beginning, it says 400 liters per hectare volume. There'll be a question later on where we're asking about that as you as an audience. But the Soltex, which in 2019 was applied at full rate, i.e. twice the amount you can see there, in 2020 was applied at a reduced rate of 568 liters per hectare. Otherwise, it's all 400 liters. Okay, next slide, please. So, what we can see here is another question saying, does anybody think that 400 litres is insufficient for some of the desiccants that we're using? So you will get literally another 30 seconds to answer that question um, and we'll get an answer in a moment. So next slide, please. So next slide is basically showing the list of treatments. Here's just where the field is at the spot east site um, down in Suffolk. And on the right is the plan layout where you can see where the RB209 plots are actually highlighted in green and the white plots are the other plots which are reduced rates. So basic design, every site had a randomization that was different, but the same treatments and the same basically protocol followed throughout. OK, next slide, please. So the results of the of the trial there just popping up that basically, does anyone use it? Yes, majority not trying anything different. Very interesting because there is work have been done on higher rates than the 400 showing some efficacy. OK, next slide, please. Oh, it's changing. It went up to 78 while I was talking. Um, somebody, somebody obviously answered the question. Right, next slide. We're going to go through each of the sites in sequence now. And um, we're going to start in the east, the, the spotty site there in Lenorma. That's what it looked like on effectively the T1 date of application. You can see the distinct yellowing there. Ground covers you'll see in a moment, but the crop is beginning to commence active senescence. Next slide, please. So looking down on the crop in the control plots, you can see there that we've got got sort of 98, 97% ground cover. The crop is green, but there is some yellowing occurring and it's certainly lodging from that image. Next slide, please. Okay, and that's the flail done on the same day, basically stripping the home down to the sort of recommended target of in the region of 15 to 20 centimeters. Difficult to achieve, but actually the foliage has been dropped nicely into the furrows away from that, that stem. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so these are the ground covers that are appearing in terms of a, a, a chart. And very simply, what you can see there is the flail drops immediately. You can see that from the previous picture. And there was no regrowth of that ground cover during the period that we monitored through to the end of August. The two treatments that you can see are substantially higher than the other, the other bulk are the control ones, which are actually not desiccated, and they drop naturally. So by around about the 13th of August, we've got 10% ground cover, but they do maintain a higher ground cover than we've got for the treatments that were desiccated with chemicals. But they're largely all the same in terms of the rate of decline. So we'll see some different graphs to this, but this is the general pattern that we observed last year in 20, sorry, in 2019, which is last year. Okay, next slide, please. So pictorially, you can see there the control. Um, basically, this is two weeks on. You can see sort of roughly 8 to 10% ground cover there in the, in, in the top left-hand side. But all of the other treatments, two weeks dead were effect later, were effectively as dead and brittle in terms of stems and no leaf material. Next slide, please. So what we've got now is the stem desiccation. And as I alluded to from the previous picture, those control treatments are highlighted in red. And where the colors are different from black, that is where there are some significant statistical differences. So basically there, we've got more green stems and fewer brittle stems and bleach stems uh, where we've got the control treatments. But effectively, all of the rest, including the flail, were very similar, either chemical or mechanical in terms of the stem desiccation. So rapid stem desiccation three and four weeks after the application of the original uh, chemical or the treatment. Okay, next slide, please. So you're going to see how we skin tubers in a moment, but here's Paul basically taking some measurements with a torque screwdriver where you get a reading in Newton meters, which is assessing the shear torque to remove the skin. So you can see the data sheet there. If we go to the next slide, please. And you can see here the time course of the treatments. Now we did a lot of treatments in trying to validate this technique at the spot east site. Um, but basically what you can see there is that the two control treatments, the one that were undesiccated, separate out from the others from the beginning. And so therefore what we've got is treatments that actually don't get desiccated or flailed do have a slower skin set. So the torque is smaller to remove the skin. And those are the only significant differences. Everything else follows the same pattern. And whilst it might look quite uh, large differences, these are actually very small differences when you compare some of the other talks that you'll see on some of the other sites. Okay, next slide, please. So we move on to the aggressive um, skinning barrel. It's lined with anti-slip uh, sandpaper effectively. We turn tubers around in here for two minutes in water to loosen the skins, and then we assess the surface area. So the next slide, please. This will show you pictorially um, what we've got in terms of uh, images. Um, and then what we'll see is from the following slide, what the skin set is in numerically. So next slide, please. And as you can see from those previous pictures, if you had a very quick glimpse in the time I moved on, that basically there wasn't much skinning of the spotty site. And this is three and four weeks after the initial treatment. We only have less than 2% surface area skinned using this barrel. And two week, a week after that, it's almost nothing. So whilst there's a significant difference between the control and anything else, basically it really is very small, those differences. The target we're aiming for at this stage in this barrel is about 15% surface area on average um, skinned and anything greater than that would mean that we'd have to wait until mechanical harvesting could continue. So look for the numbers 15% on similar slides to this later on. Okay, next slide, please. So we move on to spot north. Again, you can see there on the date of T1, the, the crop is beginning to senesce. It's, it's losing ground cover. Next slide, please. So you can see this slide here, that's the indication of ground cover going. These are the control plots or the area outside the experiment rather, where the, the similar to the control plots in the experiment. We follow to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we've got here is the ground cover time course over the season. 
And you can see there, again, the two control treatments are actually significantly greater than all of the other treatments. But they basically are all dead pretty close to around about two weeks after the point where we apply um, a, a, a chemical or mechanical control. Again, no regrowth on any of the treatments. But in this example here, you can start to see that final sand pelagonic acid is beginning to separate out. In some experiments, it's significant. The rate of decline is slower than the other chemical treatments. In some cases, it's not, but numerically it is. So pelagonic acid is following what we found in 2019, slower to kill, but does that reflect in terms of skin set? We'll see in a moment. Next slide, please. So the next slide is basically similar to the spot east. The control two weeks after the T1 application has got maybe 10 to 12 percent ground cover there. Um, there's a little bit of weed there as well, but the stems are still green, whereas all of the other treatments you can see there are effectively all desiccated and the stems are bleached and brittle. OK, next slide, please. So we can see the stem desiccation there, just repeating the previous data, that basically the control was significantly different from all the rest. And most of the chemical and, uh, and all of the chemical and, and mechanical treatments had bleached and brittle stems at three weeks. So good control of stem desiccation there. Right, okay, so the next slide, please. So this shows the torque screwdriver, fewer treatments, but this was following the protocol that everybody had. What you can see there is a more variation and a separation and actually, if you look at all those treatments, they're surprisingly enough not significantly different other than the control and the odd one about the flail. And we don't understand this, why, why it's occurred, but there is a separation there, but it's not significant. So again, lots of variation in the measurements we're taking. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of 2019 and 2020, same variety grown in a very similar um, production system, albeit a different site. But you can see in 2019, uh, basically three weeks after um, we applied the initial uh, chemical or flailed, there was virtually no skin removal. So less than 1% or less than 2% skin removal. And in 2020, whilst the numbers are bigger, there is actually no significant difference between any of those treatments, despite the control being numerically higher. So again, set skins three weeks after T1, but very low levels of skinning. Okay, next slide, please. So we move to Spot West. Now this was a crop of Royal that was ostensibly um, targeted for very late uh, desiccation, but like many of the other sites, including the two I've, I've put uh, to you already, uh, senescence started earlier, and we had to bring forward the T1 application by nearly three weeks. Okay, so next slide, please. So what you're seeing here is the ground covers are actually not 100% here at the spot where site. They're sort of around about 80% when we made our T1. And our control treatments largely drop down to around about 50% and then maintain it for the rest of the monitoring period through till the, the middle of September. So again, the treatments there separate the control versus anything else. All of the others, the flail obviously removed the foliage very quickly, so that is different. No regrowth on any other treatments, but there is a separation there, but no significant difference. Even the final SAN is again there showing um, some effects of, of being equivalent to the Gozai spotlight treatments. Okay, next slide, please. So here's the pictorial images. You can see two weeks after that there's that pretty much 70% ground cover on the control. And you've got the pelagonic acid, the Soltex, and the Spotlight Gozai combinations. Uh, a number of green stems, certainly with the final sand and Soltex, were more green than the Spotlight Gozai treatments there. Next slide, please. And then we can see the flail, much more brittle stems here compared with the chemical treatments with the exception of the spotlight and goes eye. So flail, similar to spotlight goes eye in terms of stem desiccation. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so there's the time course of screwdriver, actually no significant differences whatsoever. And this skin set is very, very uh, poor in terms of the numbers you see there. So we're only getting 0 .6, 0 0.06 as a torque reading average. Um, and you'll see that in a moment in terms of skin set. So we then move on to skin set as determined by the barrel. Next slide, please.
So what we can see here is if you ignore the T5, because there's a bit of an aberration here, in the T4, you can see the results. We've got numbers there that are pretty close to that 15%, slightly below, slightly high, with the exception of one treatment in red, which is the spotlight goes up by spotlight treatment with the standard rate of N, which inexplic inexplicably is actually 32% surface area skin. So that would not harvest. Everything else would be pretty close to skin set. However, unlike all the other sites which improved from T4 to T5, all of the treatments went backwards in terms of skin set at T5. And we checked the data three times, it is real, and we can't understand it. But everything there was basically the same, but it's the regression of skin set that's occurred on Royal. Anecdotally, we've heard this, but actually we've tested it here. And it, it does throw a curveball in all of the, uh, the nine sets of data that we've produced over the last two years. Skin set generally improves, but in this case, it reverses. Okay, next slide, please, next slide. Next slide. Okay, sorry. Um, Spot Scotland. Here you can see the sprayer working treatments here. Um, but if we follow through what the crops look like on the very early date of desiccation, so similar to the Spot East. Next slide, please. You can see the canopy there is by far and away the most vigorous of all of them. And so this was the target, the seed crops here lush green um, Im images of canopy, leaf air index probably exceeding four, and really the biggest target that we've had to date on any of the trials over the last two years. Okay, next slide, please. And we can see there the flail, a lot more foliage obviously being dropped in the furrow, still with leaves at the base of the canopy not being pruned off with the flail. So we've got green material there that's got to then be targeted by the follow-up goes eye spray. Okay, next slide, please. So here's the ground cover, um, a little bit more patchy in terms of where the controls um, sit against all the other chemicals. But like three of the, sorry, two of the other sites, the final sand or pelagonic acid is slower to kill the crop than many of the other chemical treatments. The flail um, basically drops very rapidly, um, but what you can see along around just before the 20th of August, there is a little rise in ground cover where regrowth did occur. Now, following on from 2019, Spot Scotland was the only site with any regrowth on flailed treatments. So that is worthwhile bearing in mind when we consider the, uh, the treatment in terms of application, which you'll see a little bit towards the end, and the stage of growth at which this crop was killed. So some regrowth in flail on these treatments. Okay, next slide, please. So when you can compare these with everything that's gone before you, you can see pretty much there, the control is still 100% ground cover. The pelagonic acid and the spotlight and the Soltex are all similar in terms of crop death. In this case, the, 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 uh, the final sand on this plot is actually as good as any of the other treatments. Um, but it is the rate of decline that tends to be slightly slower. And also averaging over all. Trials, but in this case, it doesn't show the effect. Next slide, please. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, this is the time course of torque screwdriver, absolutely no effect whatsoever and very poor skin set measured by this tool. In summary, the torque screwdriver isn't proving to be a very useful tool in terms of predicting skin set. Next slide, table, please. Okay, so this is the stem desiccation. And again, the control treatments 
are significantly slower in being desiccated, as you might imagine. But what we can see there is a couple of green treatments that appear, uh, T4, that the pelagonic acid and the Soltex at, at reduced nitrogen rate actually do have slightly more green stems in the plot that we were, we were measuring. Um, effectively, after four weeks, it was all dead. So that's just a temporary um, um, sort of treatment effect that we've seen there. And the flail basically was 100% brittle um, by the end, whereas none of the other treatments actually reached that level. Okay, next slide, please. So the important thing is about skin sets. You can see there again, the two control treatments are significantly slower in setting skin. And in contrast with basically the T4 treatment, which was nowhere near skin set at three weeks, there was a decision made with the team in Scotland and myself to delay the final skin set measurement until five weeks to get some reputable readings. And what we find there is by that time, most of the chemical treatments had reached just below the 15% threshold for skin set, but the controls were still significantly higher. So another week further on than the other three sites presented, but we did actually get there in contrast to the spot north, uh, sorry, the spot west, which seemed to go backwards. Okay, next slide, please. So um, I know there is quite a bit of talk about the effect of so-called passive bulking. All of our trial results that we've done to date have not shown any effect of any chemical treatment differences. But clearly in this case, this crop here is a seed crop in Spot, Spot Scotland outgrew the seed grade significantly. So we've got basically 32 to 33 tonnes of oversized material where we didn't do anything. But there is no significant difference in any other treatments in terms of the seed yield or the oversize. So we've done this over all of the experiments in the last two years and not found anything significant across all chemical desiccation treatments. Okay, next slide, please. So an overall summary. Next slide, please. So, has anybody tried reduced rates of spotlight or goze? And I will just go through the weather conditions before you come back and give the, the answers. So, next slide, please. So, this is a summary of the weather conditions. And pretty much you can see all of the three sites that were in England all had temperatures in the mid to high 20s, in one case, 30 degrees at spot north on the T1 application. Um, cloud cover low um, to moderate and the relative humidity dry to average, not humid. So general conditions, perhaps perfect or ideal for getting rapid crop care kill in combination with crops that were beginning to lose leaf cover at the time we applied RT1. Scotland, very different. You can see the two numbers there in red, 18, 19, still good for Scotland, not 13 or 14, but that does give an indication of the separation in terms of, of, of conditions. Next slide, please. Okay, so summary there. Two thirds of people have tried um, reduced rates of spotlight gozai. This might be a way looking at the previous slide on application conditions. If we can't find the right conditions, maybe we should be trying more frequent applications at a reduced rate to try and target the optimum times. Take a layer of leaves down and hit it again with another uh, application a bit later. Maybe we don't need the full rate, a bit like we did with, with, um, with Reglone. Uh, it's beginning to even up and end. Let's move on before it changes completely the other way and I have to change the story. Thank you. So summary at skin set. Basically, you've seen these data before. The summary overall um, of 2020 is that the treatments were all largely similar in terms of kill. There was no effect of nitrogen, which you'll see in the next slide, please. So despite us putting on um, 12 to 30 kilos less nitrogen, directionally was an effect, but no overall effect statistically of, of the program. Okay, next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, basically overall the two years, many crops achieved rapid skin set below that 15% that we need in our skinning barrel. The exceptions have been both crops in Scotland in 1920, and the West crop, which seems to reverse itself um, in 2020. Anything showing the signs of active senescence, so loss of leaf cover, 98% ground cover, and some yellowing responded very rapidly to desiccation in our trials. Anything greener did take longer. Now, Spotlight Gozai, on average of all the trials, was only one to two days slower in skin set than using 
Reglone in 2019 or Flail or Soltex across both years. Soltex skin set was actually as rapid as Flail, even at the half rate we tried in 2020 compared to 2019. And despite all the numerical evidence that, that the leaf kill on average with some slight variation with final sand was slower compared to the other chemical treatments, skin set was similar to all of the other chemical treatments ultimately. And that's what we're after in terms of that. There was no consistent effect of reduced N, as I just mentioned on skin set. And so targeting times that basically aiming for the maximum length of period for the crop to, to actually um, respond to the chemical would be early to mid morning, slightly higher temperatures to give the full day effectively, not too early and certainly not later in the evening um, from work that we've seen presented elsewhere. Um, skin set in 2020 was generally more rapid um, where we had drier soils. In 2019, we basically had dry soils everywhere. So we were able to achieve skin set more rapidly than in 2020. But that leads to the target. We want the soils to be drier if possible. So think about uh, re refraining from irrigation in that seven day period prior to desiccation where we can. Um, basically, Spot West, we've mentioned about this worsening apparently. Is it real or, or is it just an aberration of the experiment? The simple method of trying to detect the rate of skin set to know when you're going to harvest hasn't proved successful over the sort of year and a half that we've been testing it. So that's unfortunate. And the passive bulking has really not uh, been supported by the data we've produced over the last two years. And obviously, we need to kill everything. So um, if we're looking at virus or blight infection, then any regrowth or slow killing, we need to continue that blight program and so on. And as a summary, the second to last point is that no internal defects um, or disease prevalence increase has been identified across different treatments. OK, that's me concluded. If you can go to the next slide, please. And so you can see that I'd like to thank all of the people involved in all of those sites as people as well as just um, um, institutes. Um, and I'd like to thank all the people involved um, um, across both seasons as well as uh, those listed there. So thank you, Amber. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so we've got a few questions in. If you've got any questions, um, please continue to put them into the question box below this live panel here. Um, so question one, when using PPOs, uh, should we be measuring light intensity to aid timing? And if so, when in relation to application? Um, not all sites in 2020 had access to the MET data required to look at the spray window, which might have been only half an hour. But I have got data for most of the sites in terms of the intensity of radiation. And, and they were all generally high in 2020, even some of the ones in Scotland. But yes, it would be useful, but the number needs to compare. And, and a very high rate in terms of um, numerical uh, thing would be in the 800s to 1,000 watts per meter squared would be a very bright hour if you're applying. And if you're in the 200s, it's a very overcast, dull day. Um, and so that would give you an indication of the sort of level, but you need to have instantaneous, instantaneous values that may not always be available when you're out there spraying. So from a practical perspective then, is it the, um, is it the, the level of radiation or do you think it's the length of time um, that's the more important factor for applications? So higher radiation- It's difficult to answer day. that. Yeah, it's difficult to answer that because obviously radiation is an energy source and the energy source largely goes hand in hand with an increase in temperature. So the high temperatures may involve a desiccation effect more rapidly. Um, so you know, the leaves will wilt more rapidly and that's particularly seen with Soltex, which is a, a truly a desiccant. In other words, it dehydrates tissue that on hot days, it has a very effective way of making the crop wilt. Uh, I think the radiation levels are a slightly different story. And so having the crop actively growing at the time um, is effective. And therefore, if you're going to target a spray, the spray needs the longest period in the day to operate. But that means that if you take that logically, it would mean that you would be spraying very early morning. So I can't really answer that one in terms of, uh, of, of, of a question. It's confounded by 
you know, the length of time times the radiation. But generally, you would expect a kill to be better where radiation levels of, are intense. But that may be confounded by the length of that time that the chemical sits on the crop before sunset. Yeah, OK. Um, okay. So the next question, uh, when, when flailing and following with a PPO, is there an advantage of applying a pre-flail PPO? Yes, I talked at one stage about the effects of removing layers of leaves. And if we can take off what is effectively the most um, or the youngest, and if it's still actively growing, the most actively growing zone or layer of leaves in the canopy, that will trigger senescence far more rapidly than removing the leaves at the base of the canopy. That's, that's the triggering for senescence. So if we can apply a spray and get some removal of that um, initial upper layer, then it makes the flail operation easier because basically you've got less green material at the top of the, uh, of the canopy to layer or move away from those foliage. So it generally has less material or more brittle material that should dry and desiccate before you come and put your next PPO on one, two, three days after that flail. So maybe pre-spray one, two days, flail, and then a second application of Gozai would be the, 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 the solution to that. And we've done that with Reglone back in 1999, 2000. Um, and it was effective. So spray, flail, spray was effective on very, very vigorous crops like seed crops shown in Spots Scotland. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so another question. Did these tubers go into storage? And if so, were they monitored for any storage diseases? Yes and no. So in 2019, the programme had um, a, a, a harvest assessment of rotting and a coarse assessment on superficial blemishing diseases like skin, so skin spot and black dot um, and silver scurf. And then they were put into store and basically taken out in January to February um, and then assessed again. And the consequences of doing that were there was no effect of any treatment on any pre-storage pathology or any post-storage pathology. And in 2020, we didn't do the storage pathology, but nevertheless, there was no uh, treatment effect, including the controls um, on any black dot on the tubers within two weeks of harvest when we made the assessment, so two to three weeks. So we've got a pre-storage assessment showing no effect whatsoever and storage showing no effect either. Brilliant. Um, so we've got quite a question here about stolon detachment. Um, with the products other than the PPO inhibitors, uh, which we know have effect on this, any thoughts on this with the other products you've trialled? So I have to go back to 2019 because we didn't do any significant stolon detachment work in 2020 that I presented. But the summary of looking at the data in 2020, which has still got to be analysed, is there don't look to be any treatment effects. But I can only say they don't look to be. Whereas in 2019, the only significant effect we found on if the two levels that growers might be concerned about, either a stolon that doesn't detach easily when we pull it, or where the stolon detaches and removes a plug of tissue, which could be an entry for pathogen, bacteria, fungi, and so on, or you know, for general rotting. And um, we found that actually all chemical and flail treatments had more stolon plugging detachment than the control treatments, which is sort of the wrong way around you'd expect, but it was a consistent trend across all of the sites that natural senescence largely removed the incidence of stolon plug removal. So between all of the chemical treatments last year, um, and I think this year as well, from the data, we are not looking at any differences across chemical, whereas natural senescence can be slightly different and slightly better in terms of that. And sorry, one more thing, Amber, was very varietal specific. So last year, it was only observed on Royal to any extent. The others had very, very le low levels of any stolon adhesion or, or, or plugging. And I, I, I'm sorry, I haven't got all the data in my head from this year um, as to whether the varietal differences are still, um, still there. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. 
Um, so you mentioned earlier there's no difference in passive bulking uh, when it comes to different chemical kill programs, uh, but how do they compare with the flail? Yeah, the overall result from 2019 was that the flail had a numerical uh, advantage in terms of, or disadvantage if you want to look at yield accumulation, a numerical advantage in terms of stopping the crop in the size grade it was when we made the treatment. Not significant across all of the sites, but numerically and then averaged over all of them, it did seem to be the most rapid. Um, but it was effectively about one to two days. In 2020, I've shown you the data on the yields from the site where we would expect the greatest difference in yield. And that's where the crop canopies were growing. And the only significant difference there was the one where we didn't do anything, i.e. the control versus all of the others. So you go looking for data and say, is it going to be here? It wasn't there in the data we took from 2020, and it wasn't in Scotland also observed in 2019. So you would expect it from a canopy where leaf tears are removed, but it's not reflecting that in terms of what we're measuring um, in the experiments that we've done in the last uh, two years. Brilliant. So I've got a question here that's probably better me answering it, I guess. <laughs> um, we've done the work in 19 and 20, and they've both been fairly easy years for desiccation. Uh, so will this trial continue, continue till we get uh, a tough year? Um, so I would have thought uh, that we're going to be looking at doing some more desiccation work on the spot farms this year coming up. Um, where that goes, we haven't quite decided yet. Um, and as for do we continue with it until we get a badger? I mean, who knows what the weather's going to be? It could be 10, 20 years till we get a badger, fingers crossed. <laughs> Um, so I think it just depends, I guess, on on what the steering groups for the spot farms and what the guys feeding in um, on the panels say we should be looking at. Um, but we are going to be carrying on looking at desiccation this year. Mark, what, what would you say your view is on that? You work with us a lot. Yeah, you're, you're pretty much there. Um, we, we suspected this year from the early emergence and certainly rapid ground cover that we needed to be aware that we might actually be going um, fairly uh, fairly early. We were checking constantly, but even the sites where we were monitoring closely were brought forward by two or three weeks. Um, and we have schedules and we, we actually just hit it at the perfect time for killing the crop. But unfortunately, if we'd been there two weeks earlier, we might have had a different scenario in terms of more like the spot Scotland. So it's difficult. Um, we are faced with that. Uh, in 2020, we had some very vigorous crops um, growing, particularly the jelly seed crop at spot north, and we killed it dead in two weeks. And that was that actually looked like the spot Scotland crop that we actually had there. So conditions that we're ap applying may be more important than actually, you know, the, the crop stage. If we get everything right, the jelly crop uh, at Spot North last year, you know, Will Gag will, will, you know, will back me up on this, was was green and vigorous and, and it was the thing, but we still killed it. So we've got to look more closely at, you know, maybe tiers of leaves taking products down over maybe shorter periods. So more frequent, more frequent intervals with maybe a reduced rate to look at it. So that would be the progression, I would say, on sites where we know, like in Scotland, where it's difficult, consistently difficult to get the kill. So don't keep doing it where we know the data now um, are, are fairly sound. Let's try and repeat it where we know. And that might be a very much earlier desiccation on some crops than we'd really have for commercial yield. Yeah. Uh, so next question, did the reduced N rate reduce yields? <laughs> no. And it didn't increase them either if somebody wants to ask the reverse. Okay, perfect. Um, but well, the, 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 overall, the overall trend was for ground cover across all sites to be two to three days um, ahead in terms of desiccation. So effectively, they died two to three days earlier. And for 15 to 30 kilos, that's quite a big reduction on some crops with virtually no effect on ground cover because the crops all died so rapidly in a more normal season where they wouldn't have died. We might have expected that 30 kilos to perhaps last an excess of a week and then, then might be a difference in yield. Yeah, perfect. 
Um, so will 0.6 litres uh, of spotlight stop bulking as quickly as a flail? No, unless it's applied under conditions that we've identified where the crop is beginning to senesce um, and it's actually hit at the right time. So you'd need those, the, the, maybe not the perfect storm, but you need those two factors to come together to give a good kill. And in some cases, as evidenced by the data um, from Spot North that I showed 2019 and 2020, we can do it. Um, it's understanding the conditions where we get that rapid kill, but the flail will stop the crop dead almost effectively um, from that point, as long as we're taking all the leaves off at the time we're flailing. But I will add a caveat to that. If, the, if we kill the canopy um, and remove all the leaves, but the soil is wet and the tuber takes up water, numerically, the tuber will increase in fresh weight because there'll be water absorption. Um, so that can happen with early just, so that will see a yield increase and it will see an increase in size but it won't be massive it, it it could be three or four tons but that's a water factor it's not a bulking up factor from carbohydrate being incorporated from leaves that are still photosynthesizing okay perfect um we've got two more questions um and then i think we'll look to end uh so question here about newer varieties uh coming through with thinner skins uh, making complete skin set harder harder to achieve. What do you think of that? Yeah, we've got the, the, the evidence now from experiments about Royal um, being a thin skin variety. And we know that other varieties, uh, and some of them are in the processing as well as packing uh, side. This is an issue that they are taking longer to set. And so therefore we need to know when to take that desiccation step with the view that if they are going to take on average five weeks to set skins, um, then we need to factor that in. And that's where perhaps nitrogen regime that a compromise in nitrogen for ultimate yield might mean the canopy starts to reach that point of active senescence earlier and we get more rapid kill which could lead to skin set being achieved in four weeks not five weeks so that is a sort of issue that i'd like to sort of test we've used jelly royal the norma um jelly's not that thick skin but we still got skin set royal would be the standout one um and it, it has shown you know effectively this year that it is slower setting in both 2019 and 2020 and and therefore maybe targeting that so picking out where you you need to have some control more effectively is trying to target a program for that so you asked about 2021 that might be looking at some of those varieties not having as many varieties in that we know are thicker skinned yeah good suggestion um, and finally, what difference would RB209 plus 15% um, end rates have on skin set? Um, not tested, but we've done something similar that Amber will be aware of at Spot North. In the program that we had when we started out in 2017, Amber? That's a question. <laughs> Whenever. We started out in 2017, I believe, 2018. Um, we actually had the site recommended N from, for Maris Piper at 180 kilos per hectare. The recommended RB209 for the site would have been slightly less than 150, but make it 150. And we had a reduced rate of 120 in there. And we actually found that skin set was numerically um, res responsive to N. So the lower the N, the more rapid the skin set or the more skins were set at three weeks after you know, normal desiccation. So the harvest we took was three weeks after we, we actually did the, get the greatest skin set or the most skin set on the 120 and the 180 was effectively 30 kilos more than the 150. And I do believe there's also work from Spot East on Estima showing a range, a bigger range, four levels of nitrogen. And the direction there was, again, RB209 and reduced levels. Um, the reduced levels gave 
a, a, a more uh, uh, set skin at a fixed period after. So yeah, there's one site to my knowledge where you've done more than RB209 and it's numerically reduced the speed of skin set. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and those results are on the website. Okay. So if you want to have a look at any more of those in any more detail, they're available there. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thank you very much for all of the teams um, out there that have done the work this year. Um, we've had a lot of good conversations about desiccation. So obviously, you know, there's probably a bit more to do next year on it as well. Um, if we could have the final slide. Uh, I just want to ask you all uh, to scroll down and fill in the feedback survey um, that's below the live feed. Uh, we've also got your unique ID reference for the basis and neuroso points. So if you go to where you put these in, um, take a, make a note of these um, numbers and you can claim your basis and neuroso points for today's session. Uh, the Agronomist Induction continues tomorrow morning at 9am and the Agronomy Week webinars continue tomorrow at 11am. So I hope you'll be joining us for some of those as well. Um, and I just want to make uh, say a big thank you again to Mark uh, for joining us this evening. Thanks very much.